The Terrible Two by Mac Barnett and Jory John. Illustrated by Kevin Cornell. Read by Miss Claybaugh. Chapter 22. Crickets, said Principal Barkin. He was leaning so far over his desk that his purple head hovered uncomfortably in what Miles considered his personal zone. Crickets? Yes, said Miss Shandy, who was seated in a big chair next to Miles's big chair. Crickets. Miss Shandy, I was addressing Miles. Principal Barkin hovered. Crickets! Yes, said Miles. Crickets. Miles Murphy, is this your idea? Barkin's nose wrinkled and his tongue rested against his two front teeth. Of a prank? No, sir. A cloud of crickets erupting from a shoebox. Girls screaming. Boy is screaming. Josh Barkin ducking under his desk like he was in an earthquake drill. Stuart standing on his chair and holding a leaf aloft, crying out, it's okay, everybody. I have an idea. Crickets leaping onto faces, into hair. Crickets bouncing off the walls. Stuart waving the leaf. Where had he even gotten the leaf? Shouting, it's their food. The feeling of crickets on flesh, the noise, the collective chirping, more like a constant screech, like a car spinning through an intersection. It was an amazing prank. But sadly, no. It hadn't been Miles' idea. Then why, Miles Murphy, did you release a swarm of crickets into Miss Shandy's classroom? It was an accident, said Miles. An accident. Principal Barkin smirked the smirk of a principal who had a troublemaker cornered. And why, Miles Murphy, were there thousands of crickets in your backpack? Miles winced the wince of a cornered troublemaker. As soon as the crickets had erupted from his backpack, Miles had known he'd have to answer this question. But he hadn't come up with an answer. What could he do? Tell the truth? Of course not. Principal Barkin would never believe his own school helper could be responsible for something like this. Niles was right. He was above suspicion. Plus, telling the truth would be ratting, and Miles wasn't a rat. And also, the truth involved confessing to making a diorama of Principal Barkin taking a bubble bath, which seemed unwise. Miles was stuck, and he knew it. What could he say? Why would he have thousands of crickets in his backpack? It was a visual aid, said Miles, to enhance my presentation. The color of Barkin's face seemed to flicker. A what? Miss Shandy said, even though we wouldn't get extra credit, we could use visual aids if we thought they might supplement our own learning and the learning of the class. Is this true, Miss Shandy? Miss Shandy was giving Miles a strange look. I did say that, yes. Well, in that case... Barkin's face softened and took on the hue of a nectarine before going right back to eggplant. But wait, Miles Murphy, this is ridiculous. A visual aid is a diorama or something. How is a swarm of crickets supposed to supplement the learning of your class? Well, my oral report was on the pharaohs of Egypt. These crickets were supposed to represent the plague of locusts. You know, from the ten plagues? Because, as I'm sure you know, scientists and historians believe the story of the Ten Plagues might have actually arisen from real natural disasters. Of course I know that, said Principal Barkin. That's true, isn't it, Miss Shandy? Yes, said Miss Shandy, still looking at Miles. Well, said Miles, I wanted to show what a swarm of locusts would look like. Only the crickets weren't supposed to get out. Miles put on his most sincere face and shrugged. I guess I ended up doing a better job supplementing the class's learning about swarms than I'd even planned to. An innocent chuckle faded back to rueful earnestness. I know I sure learned a lot. Principal Barkin exhaled through his nose. He sat in his chair and slouched. I don't know. Something smells bad. Probably the crickets, said Miles helpfully. They kind of smelled like sweat. 
Not literally, said Barkin. Something spell smells bad metaphorically. And Barkins have great metaphorical noses. Something is off here, Miles Murphy. Something is wrong. This, Miles Murphy, is strike two. What was strike one? Miles asked. Strike one was parking my car at the top of the steps, which I still don't know how you did. I didn't. Just as you say you didn't mean to release the crickets. And in this metaphor, saying you aren't responsible for a prank constitutes a strike. Strike three will be another prank that you deny committing, which will mean that you have struck out, which in this metaphor means that you will actually have done that prank and all the other pranks. So strike three makes the previous strikes real, in essence transforming them from denied pranks to Principal Barkin, said Miss Shandy. If that's all, I think Miles should probably get back to the classroom and start rounding up the crickets. Uh, yes, of course, said Barkin. Miss Shandy, if you'll remain here, there's something I'd like to discuss with you. Miles stood up. Was this really it? Would he really be leaving unpunished? Are you lollygagging? Barkin shouted. Go! Chapter 23 Niles Sparks was waiting on the other side of Barkin's door. You are one slippery customer, said Niles. That visual aid business was inspired. How'd you hear that? Niles produced a drinking glass from behind his back. Old-fashioned listening device, he said. Does it really work? Miles asked. Try it. Miles held the tumbler up to the door and pressed his ear against the bottom. Yes, but I didn't cancel class, Miss Shandy was saying. I just had the students continue their presentations down on the lower field instead of in a classroom full of crickets. Yes, yes, I understand that, said Barkin. It's just that you must know that we Barkins are sensitive to even the appearance of an interruption in instruction. And I think you'll find I'm being very open-minded. I mean, if my father had seen all your students all gathered under that oak tree in the middle of a school day. Miles handed back the glass to Niles. Neat, he said, trying not to express how neat he actually found it. The two boys headed down the hallway. This time you actually did come up with a really good prank, Niles said. Gee, thanks, said Miles. I mean it. How'd you know I was going to do it? Niles stopped. How'd you know I was going to switch the shoeboxes? Miles asked. I saw you changing out of those wingtips in the parking lot before school all last week, said Niles. It was pretty easy to figure out why you'd have a pair of shoes exactly like mine if you didn't want to wear them. Although, you really should give wingtips a try. Once they're broken in, they're, they actually conform to your foot and, but how? You took the crickets when you switched the shoe boxes. Then I swapped your diorama for mine while you weren't paying attention. What were you doing, just looking down at your desk? Let me guess, picturing me up there with that bark and diorama. Miles didn't say anything. Something I've learned, said Niles. You can't celebrate a prank before it's over. Miles couldn't tell whether he was angry at, angrier at himself or at Niles. Probably Niles. Oh, great. Expert advice from Dr. Expert. It wasn't a great line, but he was very angry. Miles, this is like a magician revealing the secrets behind his tricks. I'm only telling you this stuff because I respect your talent for improvisation. That's why the Terrible Two is a great, oh please. You know, Niles, it's easy to sit there and tear everything down. But it's another thing to actually create something. What? Seems to me this prank war's been pretty one-sided. I keep coming up with pranks, you keep foiling them. Big deal. Why should I want to team up with you? Because you figured out how to park a car at the top of some steps once? Great. Oh, wow. You've been playing defense for the last six weeks. If you're such a great prankster, then bring it. Okay, said Niles, and walked off. Miles went to clean up some crickets. Cow Fact 777 Average cows weigh about 1,400 pounds, and absolutely none of them feel self-conscious or weird about it.
Fact 778. Studies have shown that classical music helps cows produce more milk. So the next time you need milk from your cow fast, throw on some Tchaikovsky, Chopin, or Bach. Fact 779. Cows eat 100 pounds of grass per day. Need a lawnmower? Consider a cow. Chapter 24 Miles Murphy was losing sleep. He was eating less. Lately, people had been saying his face looked a little gray. Your face looks a little gray, Holly said when she saw Miles in the hall. Are you all right? Miles Murphy was not all right. For the past two months, he'd been anticipating attack, an attack that had never come. He hadn't even been able to enjoy his winter break because he was worried Niles was going to prank him at the mall or in his house or when he was hiding from Josh Barkin behind a mailbox. Now that school was back in session, nowhere was safe. They'd been back for three weeks and Niles still hadn't pranked him, probably because of Miles' tireless vigilance. It was a kind of victory, but it felt awful. Holly walked down the hallway with no hesitation. She rounded corners, waved to kids, smiled at teachers, drummed on lockers as she passed them. She had energy, charisma. Miles, meanwhile, kept a step or two behind Holly. He had to. Miles Murphy was at DEFCON 5, or DEFCON 1, whichever DEFCON was the most alert, most serious DEFCON. It was DEFCON 1, a fact Miss Shandy had mentioned in Social Studies last Tuesday. But lately, Miles hadn't been paying attention in class because of an all-consuming, single-minded readiness about being the hallmark of DEFCON 1. Holly pointed to a sign on the wall. It said, Principal Barkin says election time. The rest of the wall was taken up by a campaign poster, a huge black and white photograph of Josh Barkin and his father. The poster was festooned with crepe paper bunting. Above Josh's head was his slogan. Josh Barkin, your current class president, your future class president, your eventual principal. Cast your vote for me on 4-1. I bet you he stole those streamers from the art room, Holly said. And he gets the good real estate next to the drinking fountain. I had to put mine by the teacher bathroom. She pointed to another poster down the hall. It said, A vote for Holly Rash is a vote for Holly Rash. She shrugged. But hey, someone's got to fight the power. They continued down the hall. Good morning, Alice, Holly said to Alice. Hey, Scotty, Holly said to a kid presumably named Scotty. They rounded a corner and there he was. Hi, Niles. Hi, Holly. Hi, Miles. Miles should have looked away, but Niles caught Miles' eye and smiled. Miles' stomach, already sensitive after weeks of a mostly fruit snack diet, gurgled and churned. Niles' smile was basically an ordinary smile, innocent and sunny, typical of Niles' school helper mask. But there was something else, something at the corner of Niles' eyes. Confidence. Mischief. Danger. For weeks, this smile had been inducing fear and anger and nausea in Miles. In the middle of class, Niles would turn to Miles and smile. After school, as Miles crossed the parking lot, Niles would wave and smile. At night, Niles' smiling face appeared in Miles' dreams. Except in his dreams, Niles' head was covered in coarse br blonde bristles and he had little red eyes that flashed. And also the dreams took place in the dairy aisle of a supermarket. It was weird. Anyway, Niles smiled everywhere. Niles knew Miles hated the smile. And Miles knew Niles knew. And Niles knew Miles knew Niles knew. And somehow all this knowledge was folded back into the smile. The smile was an omen, a portent. The smile meant a prank was coming. Sometimes, late at night, Miles would wonder if the smile was the prank. 
but in the mornings when the sun came through his window, Miles knew he'd never get off that easy.